Hey everybody, welcome back. I have another video for you. Thank you, of course, for the support. It means so much to me. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, well, I'm not going to go into too much detail today. This is going to be a fairly short, uh, quick little video here, but I want to talk about a statement that was made um well, a statement that was made by Putin the other day at a uh, press conference, and I think it is of note because it really does speak to some of the issues that we've been talking about, that I've been talking about for quite a while, really, since this war began. And what I mean is, just to be more clear here, what I mean is the motivations for Putin, the real motivations behind this war, because I began back in late February by asking why, how the hell could he have made such an obvious strategic blunder? And I think that as we've moved on from February through March, April, and May, and now into June, I think it is very clear that while Russia may uh, have the upper hand on the battlefield, as I think Think that they do. Um, in the long term, Russia is now in a very, very um, precarious position, despite whatever propaganda the Kremlin wants to churn out about uh, the global south and Russia as the leader and the vanguard of the fight against uh, the West and all of this other stuff. Um, ordinary Russians know that their lives are materially worse now than they were several months ago, and that they will continue to be uh, continue to deteriorate in the uh, months and probably years to come. Uh, at the very least, we're not going to see a return, uh, economically speaking, we're not going to see a return for Russia anytime soon. Now, whether the Russians and Putin himself believe that they can withstand the economic pain longer than those in Europe and the United States can, they may be right about that. I don't know yet, but we shall see. Ultimately, though, Russia's in a bad situation. So it again raises the question for us, how could he have been so foolish? What could he have been thinking? Now, if you want to be one of the Putin-loving uh, uh, propagandists, you know, those who think that Putin can do no wrong and those who think that Putin is just, you know, more or less just kind of not such a bad guy, you know, he, he may have been uh, made some mistakes, but ultimately he's doing the right thing in fighting against the empire here, right? For those people, of course, they will always have uh, whatever justifications are necessary at hand to uh, explain away the crimes that uh, the Russians have committed. Naturally, the primary argument, I mean, and this is, of course, not news to any of you, the primary argument continues to be NATO expansion, right? The idea that that Russia was forced, that it had no choice but to wage a war against Ukraine with all of the war crimes and everything else that they've committed, that they had no choice but to wage that war because of the intransigence of the United States and NATO and, of course, of its allies in Europe, that this continued eastward expansion of NATO represented an existential threat to Russia, and Russia absolutely had to respond. And the, so by framing it in that way, you are ultimately justifying and excusing what Russia is doing in Ukraine. It's abhorrent, quite frankly. Anybody who's ever called themselves an anti-war activist has to understand when you see a war, when you see war crimes, when you see a country invade another country, we cannot live in an alternate reality. But these many of these people do. That's how they choose to uh, construct their worldviews and so forth. But we are still grounded in reality. And for those of us who are still grounded in reality, we know who was the aggressor in this war. But it again raises the question of why. If the Putin cheerleaders want to say NATO expansion, NATO expansion, NATO expansion, as Putin has said himself many times, why do they ignore when Putin has a moment of honesty? where he does reveal some of the real motivations behind this. They have to ignore it because it undermines the argument that Putin acted rationally in response to external threats from the United States. The, the idea that Putin may have chosen to wage this war for a variety of reasons, including his own hubris, including his uh, lack of recognition of Ukraine as a country and all of the other reasons, to acknowledge all of that is to make Putin into a criminal, which he is.
right? But if you're if you think of your job as to kind of absolve Putin and Russia and to heap all blame on the United States, well, then the only thing you can really say is NATO. And yet here comes Putin at a press conference just yesterday uh, on Thursday, June uh, 9th, who basically when he's when he's asked a question. He just drops all pretense and he makes a very open and honest statement. And the the statement was quoted by journalists who were there, quote, during the war with Sweden, Peter the Great didn't conquer anything. He took back what had always belonged to us, even though all of Europe recognized it as Sweden's. It seems now it's our turn to get our lands back. And he smiled. End quote. I think that's pretty clear. It that is the word that I've been using all of these months. That is imperial revanchism. That is neo-colonialism. He sees Russia's job as to reclaim and reconquer the Ukrainian territory that he feels is justifiably Russian. Okay, now I want to just pull back for a second. I understand that if you're listening to me, you're probably already understanding what I'm trying to get at here, that this is that this is revenge. This is imperial revanchism. This is neocolonialism. This is seeing your neighbor as not an independent state, but your neighbor as rightfully yours, belonging to you, belonging to historic Russia and whatever. Right. So that is at a very basic level, that is what this is. But let's pull back and ask about the history here. And why would he say it? Why would he say Sweden? Okay, now think back to your history classes. Maybe you've forgotten some of that European history. I'm not a historian. I'm sure I could bring people for interviews that could speak much more uh, uh, in detail about all of the history of this. But at a very basic level, Russia, in alliance with several other European uh, uh, powers, monarchies in the at the end of the 17th and the beginning of the 18th century, uh, waged war against Sweden. Sweden had been a dominant European power in the northern parts of Europe. And uh, I believe at the time, uh, at the very at the very beginning of the century, uh, Charles the Twelfth, the famous uh, Swedish king, had ascended to the throne. And um, Peter, along with some of his allies, sensed an opportunity to more or less claw back some of the territory that prior wars had gained for the Swedish Empire. Okay, so what happens is ultimately uh, the Northern War, as it's known, the Northern War begins. Uh, Sweden, if I recall correctly, really kind of steamrolls some of the smaller European allies. But in the end, uh, Sweden is turned back. Russia, under Peter the Great, ultimately defeats Sweden at the famous and decisive Battle of Poltava. And that is, you know, one of the great uh, historic um uh, triumphs for the czars for for Russia. Okay, now the Battle of Poltava takes place in present day Ukraine. So again, what Putin is doing by referencing the war with Sweden, he's doing multiple things simultaneously. One, he's referencing a czarist past, an imperial glory, and not just any czar, the czar, the great modernizer, the uh, czar who led the European, you know, sort of the Europeanification, Europeanification of Russia, which is interesting considering that Russia is, is essentially breaking away from Europe. In that sense, Putin may see himself as something of a bookend, Peter on one end and Putin on the other. Uh, Putin certainly w- has presented himself, and it's certainly in the minds of his, uh, his staunch supporters, as more or less the new czar, the, the, the real czar of Russia. So he's reaching to the imperial past, both for a historic triumph, the Battle of Poltava, but also to make very clear reference to Ukraine. This wasn't just any battle. This was a battle over what we now call Ukraine. And simultaneously, there's another historic parallel that for some of the more um, uh, educated, more informed Russian listeners would 
intuitively understand this. It's not only about Ukraine. It is about what the Ukrainians were doing at that time, because the Ukrainians under the hetman at that time, the leader of, I guess you could say leader of what we would call Ukraine, sided with the other side, sided against Russia, as you could imagine. Okay, and so now again, Putin is creating this this sort of um, or attempting to create a a historic analog between what is happening now and is you know, a a precedent in you know the the past of three hundred and twenty or so years ago. Now, for casual listeners, it just might seem like okay, well, Putin is is talking about one conquest and now he wants to do another. But there's so much more to it. It is about the fundamental right of Russia to control all of the areas around it, not just what we now might call a sphere of influence, but in fact, all of the historic lands that Russia ever controlled. In other words, Putin is basically saying and kind of winking and maybe even warning to Europe, like, I consider all of historic Russian imperial territory to be Russian. How do you think that, how do you think that message lands in the Balkan states? How do you think that message lands in the Baltic states? How do you think that message lands in places like Ukraine and Belarus and elsewhere? In other words, what Putin is doing is he's simultaneously signaling that this is about Ukraine, but this is also about the Russian Empire. This is about reconstituting the Russian Empire. This is where I always kind of part ways with some of my uh, some of my colleagues and friends on this idea that Putin is trying to reconstitute the Soviet Union. He is not. He's trying to reconstitute the Russian Empire or remake it in, in a sort of new and more modernized form. That's what he's talking about. Let me read it again. Let me read what he says. He says that Peter the Great didn't conquer anything. He took back what had always belonged to us, even though all of Europe recognized it as Sweden's. He's saying, I don't care. Who recognizes what as far as territorial sovereignty? Doesn't matter to me what borders are, who's agreed to it, what the what the international community may think. What I'm in, what I'm engaged in is reconstituting our past glory. Now, I don't have to explain probably for all of you how that is extremely in line with what we understand to be fascist politics, right? This this hearkening back to a, a glorious past that's very much a fundamental aspect of fascism. Also, the complete rejection of any set of universal norms or international law, which is ultimately what he's saying, that is also absolutely a part of imperialist thinking. Now, again, I would direct this message to a lot of the people who want to sit and sort of uh, dissemble and genuflect and whatever over all of the different ways in which Russia is technically not imperialist or whatever. Bullshit. This is absolutely what we're talking about here. We are talking about imperialist, revanchist politics, a reconstitution of the Russian Empire, just as Dugin has long since advocated. This is straight out of Dugin, which is interesting considering that people have spent years trying to tell me how Dugin is not really influential in Russia, how Dugin's ideas are pretty marginal, how he's like an Alex Jones figure. Well, all I can tell you is pretty much every statement that Putin makes lines up almost identically with uh, Alexander Dugin and fourth political theory and foundations of geopolitics and all of his ideas about the future of human civilization. So, hey, what can I tell you? I mean, if it if it if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, so. Uh, the point also that needs to be made is about this idea of uh, belonging to us, right? Putin doesn't want to hear anything about the fact that Russian culture is to a large extent cobbled together from various influences, most especially from Ukraine, from the Kievan Rus, which is the heart of the early period before there was a Russia, the origin of what we now call modern Russia and the Russian people. Right. He, he, he doesn't want to talk about it in that way. He doesn't want to say that we belong to them. They belong to us. That is our 
territory. Now, this, of course, connects back to the oligarchs. This connects back to the uh, natural resources. The uh, people like Putin and those around him, they believe that the idea of Ukrainian sovereignty is a direct affront to them and their material interests. Why should the Ukrainian oligarchs get to control Ukraine's resources and exploit the country to their for their interests? That's our job. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'll leave it there, but I will, um, I will just say that when he made this statement, he finally was able to speak truthfully, finally, thankfully. He spoke very truthfully about it, and um, I guess we should probably thank him for that. Of course, um, this really does need to inform how we talk about this because all uh, a whole segment of the left online is going to just crow about the fact that this is all about NATO. Putin's not talking about imperial revanchism. Read his words for yourself. You'll see it. Talk to you all later.